Hello, and welcome to Shape the System, where we find and tell the stories that help people to rethink the way the world works. We interview people from all over the world who are helping to change our systems for the better. Shape the System is an independent podcast with support from KPMG High Growth Ventures, who help ambitious founders and their teams scale up for success. More about KPMG High Growth Ventures after the interview. We hope you enjoy this episode. I mean, if we're laughing when we start the show, that's always wonderful. Um, Hello, everyone. Welcome to the show. We're going to be talking about all manner of farming today. We're going to talk a lot about regenerative farming. So firstly, welcome Breda and Bryce from Lundberg Farms to the show. You guys are in Northern California, which is a part of the world that's very dear to me. So I'm super excited to have you on from that part of the memory lane. But welcome to the show. Just give us the two-second snapshot of Lundberg Farms. And then we can dive into the the way we always do the problem statement and go from there. Well, Vincent, we're a, a multi-generational uh, family farm. Started in 1937 when my grandparents came to California from uh, Nebraska. And uh, I'm a third generation farmer. Breach is a fourth generation. And uh, there's 40 family members that own Lumberg Family Farms. Wow. And uh, and But then the, the team here that farms and uh, handles the paddy rice and handles the popping of the of the rice cakes and the milling it's the team is about 400 and so we're really um thankful to have uh, a family that's supportive and committed to multi-generational family farming and a team here that buys into our vision on producing healthy organic products Wonderful. All right. And we're yeah, going to get to that product. Yeah, sorry, Britta, go. Yeah, you forgot the most important part. We grow rice. <laughs> <laughs> we grow rice and we make all sorts of things with it. So 17 different varieties of rice, um, rice blends. We pop rice cakes right on site, um, make rice cake minis, rice chips, uh, risottos. Great. You know, if you can make it with rice, we do. <laughs> we make it with rice. All right. <laughs> cool. We do. Rice is a plant. Yeah, yeah. yeah, rice is a plant. It grows <laughs> in the ground. <laughs> and how it grow? How we grow it matters. Matters. It matters. Yeah, mm-hmm. and we're going to talk about that because I want to get to that. But I want to start like we always do with understanding the status quo. Now we can mm-hmm. talk about farming more broadly, or if it's useful, and I think it might be, we could talk more specifically about how rice farming is done as a microcosm for how farming is done. So before we get to how you do it in in the organic nature of it, and also the regenerative nature of it, because there's some some differences there, and we will talk about that. Tell me, help me understand how rice traditionally or currently is grown in the mainstream, either in the US or globally generally. Well, you know, rice is, you know, two thirds of the world eats rice uh, at least once a day and, and many three times a day. And so rice is grown all over the world. In our part of the world, we have one crop a year. We plant it here in the springtime, and then we, it grows all summer and we harvest it in the fall. The spring for us is planting time is, is May and harvest time is October, November. And we prepare a seed bed, which involves first turning in or, or, or uh, handling the cover crop and getting it uh, put back into the soil and then preparing the seed bed. And then after the seed bed's been prepared, we flood the field and then we s- seed rice by airplane, soaked seed, that, that falls into the water and then starts to grow as soon as it hits the water. For us, the biggest issues in organic rice are have to do with weed management. We just have thousands, millions, hundreds of millions of weeds that grow in with the rice. And for every rice plant, there could be at least 10, up sometimes up to 50 weed seeds uh, that are going to grow. And so that's our biggest challenge. For us, it's done with water. And how we manage water in the rice. For most farmers, it's done with herbicides and um, managed with various different herbicides or cocktails of herbicides. Then we harvest in the fall. You want to say, Brie? Yeah, most farmers will fly on an herbicide to kill the the grass weeds early in the season and then another one to kill the aquatic weeds. Um, Whereas we are using water to drown the grass weeds and then we dry up the aquatic weeds. So we raise the water level 
just high enough to drown the grass weeds, but not so high that it harms the rice, which can survive underwater for about 24 to 48 hours longer than the grass weeds. Mm. So that's our window to make sure the grass weeds die while the rice survives. It's a Um, very narrow window. Very narrow window. You got to be out there. You got to be out there watching it. And when the weeds have said, I've had enough. And uh, and when the rice is going to say, now this is the time we got to get the rice through and get it and get it strong. Mm-hmm. So let me just try to understand this. So I, I, I want to get to the to, to how your farm does it in a minute because there's a lot of detail in there that I, I definitely want to go into. But a traditional farm, what you're essentially saying is growing rice is already incredibly water intensive. Right, it's one of the most water intensive crops that we consume. From my understanding, cotton is also very water intensive, but we obviously don't eat cotton. I don't think so. Um, so there's there's a huge amount of water that's traditionally used, and the traditional farmer or the large scale kind of ag farmer will basically say, "We already put a bunch of water in there. The last thing we need is to be going and getting more water to be able to try and you know solve this problem around potential weeds, you know, grass weeds or the the other type of weeds." And our approach is to basically just drown this thing in pesticides to predominantly, you know, that supposedly will be kill those and not kill the rice and supposedly won't have a problem. And this is kind of one fundamental challenge of it. I, I want to understand one other aspect as well, which is how a more Vincent, traditional... If you yeah. can hold that thought just a bit. Sure. Is, you know, yeah, we, grow rice, we grow rice because our soil is rice ground. Mm. And, well, it's heavy clay, very right. heavy clay, and about three feet down or, or two feet down to three feet down is hard pan. It is compressed clay and sand. Right. And um, water doesn't percolate through it. Right. And and so it looks like we're using a lot of, wa- of water because the water stands on the soil. Right. But if that same amount of water was on an almond orchard or on a, a tomato field, it would just be gone. Right. Right. It just go right through. And so the amount of water we apply isn't a lot more than would be applied for a, uh, a other crops. Uh, yeah. It just it just doesn't leave. It just yeah. stays there. Practically, how do you get the water in and out? Like when you say, all right, I've had enough, we've killed the weeds, but we don't want to kill the rice. Where does it go again? Like, do you have to sieve it back off or take it? How do you, how did that even work? Well, we do have just a series of weirs and checks. So, mm. uh, you know, the, the, the land we have here is super flat. Right. And it's about one inch of fall for every hundred feet. And, wow. and so, um, we, yeah. We have these levees, and, and so yep. it looks like uh, uh, fields from you might see in other uh, other parts of the world, where you just have levees and, yeah. and patties, and levees yeah. and patties. And when you want to take it down, hopefully you've got a, a place to take it. That's the next field down, and you're, it's leaving one field that's going to go into the next field. Yeah. But when you um, need to let the rice through, you stop adding water. And and let the rice just sag down, or the water sag down, just maybe about an inch. Yeah. And and then the the rice wants to come through. Mm. It's the next step, though, when you need to d- address the the aquatic weeds. Mm. All along, the aquatic weeds are just loving this water, right? Right. <laughs> sure. And um and so then we do completely release the water, and mm. um and so it it will go back to to ditches or creeks or streams, and eventually go back toward the Sacramento River. Mm. But on many of our farms, th- it's a series of fields that start at, at the north and go mm. to the south. And you want to start planting at the north. And when you release the water on the most northern field, it's going to go into the next field. Right. And then it's going to go to the next. And and so it's not really, you're not releasing water away from the farm until mm. it gets to the very bottom uh, yep. of the field. And, and so it may be going through eight fields before it, it gets toward the uh, end of the farm because water is such Understood. a valuable resource. You don't yeah. want to just use it once and, uh, Let it go. and say, I'm done with it. Yeah. Say, I'm, <laughs> I'm going to use that. In, and, and on an organic farm, you can just take it from one field to the next and the next mm. uh, and say, just come out of an organic farm field and it's going to go right into the next organic field. Right. And just getting back to the impact to like what happens if – if you are farming in the traditional way, is it a, largely a health impact that's a problem or is it a resource usage when you farm rice the way that other producers would farm rice? Like what's the net impact to us, society or environmentally? Well, I think there are air quality issues. There's water quality issues. And uh, and then there's um, people issues. And uh, and so I think they're all, all, th- all three of those. Um, 
and the climate impact of, of using all those chemicals Absolutely. as well. That's right. Help me understand that a bit more. We think that the way we farm organic rice has some real climate smart, it's really climate smart, right? Growing cover crops and, uh, yeah. and not using the, um, the conventional fertilizers and the conventional herbicides are really climate smart farming and, uh, and is making a difference as far as the climate. Yeah, instead of using fossil fuel-based fertilizers to, to add fertility to our fields, we grow cover crops, which right. are like oats, vetch, and fava beans. They're, they're you know, crops that we grow for the health of the soil mm. and the environment rather than, um, you know, for the table. And they're really cool. We like to call them like green juice for the ground because right. they restore nutrients to the soil, but they also do so many other things. Of course, they help sequester carbon by allowing photosynthesis to occur year round. They also help prevent erosion and they provide habitat for species. Yep. And they build uh, organic matter. Mm -hmm. And the, the higher the organic matter you have, the more connecting points you have for the soil to hold for fertility, mm -hmm. right? And, and you're looking for all those points, a high organic matter field versus one that just doesn't have any, what yeah. doesn't look like any life in it, doesn't have a connecting points for for holding that fertility. Sure, and, uh, understood. And the more of that you have, the more you have water holding capacity as well. Yep. Interesting. Yep. And so, so all, all these right? climate benefits instead of mm. using those like chemical fertilizers, um, which can be really harmful to the soil health um, and the surrounding environment. And it's like, how do you, like, just before we move into some of the more, de the details in regenerative farming, because there's mm -hmm. about 15 in there that I want to dive into. Yeah. <laughs> Why do you think farmers who, don't farm the way you do farm the way they do? Like, is it just legacy or like what, what leads you to have to want to stay doing that? It doesn't sound like any reason you'd want to do it. Well, I think there's a lot of reasons they do. And, and one is organic farming or generative organic farming is riskier, right? Mm. There, there isn't a, Hey, we've, um, we've said it and forget it. Uh, I've treated the, uh, the field with, um, herbicide yeah. at seven days or at 10 days it's cleaned off the herbicides and now i'm just going to be able to, yeah. to you know on um, automatic pilot we didn't go on a lot of summer vacations when i was growing up <laughs> because <laughs> that's when we have to be out there reading the rice right, right like we're, right. Not, we're not going by a calendar like my dad said we're not setting and forgetting it and yeah. applying the the herbicide when the calendar says to, you know, we're out in the fields reading the rice, trying to make mm. sure that fourth leaf on the on the rice plant gets a, a breath of air. And that that takes time and that takes mm. presence in your yeah. fields. Yeah. And if you if you don't get it right the first time, you don't get a second chance on on organic. If you don't get right. it right the first time on a conventional, there are you know, you can go with a cleanup herbicide and if that one doesn't work, you can get an, an, another and Sometimes a conventional farmer would use three or four different herbicides and, at different times. So yeah, it's a whole lot risky, uh, less risky. Mm. But I would say it's um, it's a um, I think it's a decision you want to make about what what's your philosophy of farming and and what's your what's and your I, approach. I also think the business model is different because a lot of conventional farmers they they grow their rice and then they deliver it to. A co-op, you know, we've got we've got one just down the road from us where where rice from a ton of different growers is is all delivered. That's right. Um, it goes to a, a big drying and storage facilities, mm -hmm. and they can just deliver it, mm -hmm. and it's done. It's, right. They they aren't going to be part of selling it. They don't have to talk about package their it farming like methods rice cage. Or, <laughs> right. <laughs> exactly. They don't have that direct relationship with with people who want to know how their their rice was grown where it came from and and so it's it's a different business model as well mm, fascinating all right that's just some super good juicy stuff that we've started off in there and because you guys have been at this for since 1937 i think you said for us <laughs> right before if i got the number right you're exactly which right is, <laughs> and i was actually going to lean on that a little bit which is this idea that to, to farm a certain way you have to it kind of is a reflection of values and ethos and values and ethos seem to be, and I want to get to the regenerative bit, but seem to be such a critical part. So before we get into the regenerative bit, how is it that you, the family has kind of developed this ethos? And was this always the way? Is this how you guys thought in <laughs> the late 1930s? Or where did this come from? 
Yeah, well, I think it goes right back to 1937 um, when my great grandparents, Albert and Francis Lundberg, left Nebraska in the wake of the Dust Bowl. And I don't know how much you know about the Dust Bowl, but it really blew, <laughs> like right. literally and figuratively. Right. It was an environmental disaster caused in part by short sighted farming techniques and drought mm. that stripped the land of its topsoil, which is that uppermost layer of soil that produces something like 95% of the world's food. It's right. pretty important. And and during the Dust Bowl, all the topsoil blew away from the Midwest. And so, of course, you know, wreaked havoc on the farm. And so when great grandpa Albert and great grandma Francis moved to California, they brought with them their four young sons, a farm all tractor because they were worried that the tractors in California would be oh. no good. Um, a flatbed Chevy <laughs> truck and and crucially a, a new philosophy, which was to leave the land better than they found it. Yeah. And they saw what the farming techniques caused in mm-hmm. the Midwest. Mm. Grandpa Absolutely. was committed not to do that here. Mm-hmm. He said, we're going to farm a new way. Yeah. We're going to farm in partnership with nature. And when other farmers were burning their rice straw off because a single match could burn hundreds of acres of rice straw. Yeah. He said that rice straw came from the soil. It's going to go back to the soil. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And a lot of farmers are in our area would laugh at us for being committed to turning all the straw back in. It was harder. It's a, a lot of work, but yeah, I think in the nice long run, yeah. It, no summer it, breaks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But it was just a an outcropping of the um, of the things Grandpa learned from farming through the Dust Bowl and what he taught his his boys mm-hmm. about farming and and he would say you know we're not going to stop growing cover crops we're going to keep growing cover crops even when conventional fertilizers became the norm right. we're going to continue to grow cover crops and and build the soil the natural way mm. I would say it came from Grandpa. But the other thing that's just kind of a bit unusual and is that the four brothers were each given land by their parents and they could have farmed separately, but they said, we're going to farm together. And it helped them, I think, be able to be dedicated to organic farming, mm-hmm. that they could spread the risk over a larger um, piece of land and, uh, and the four of them could cover for each other and, mm-hmm. and support each other uh, uh, when when if you're just by yourself, you got to say, "Hey, I got, I got to just do it as easy as I can." But yeah, yeah. I'm, I mean, the thing I'm interested about this is that, like, the term kind of organic and regenerative. I'm sure these terms have been around forever. Like, organic's not a new word, but the idea that that there's a lot of people now, there's a there's a zeitgeist that says, "I'm aware of organic food, and I have a desire or a preference to purchase it." And farmers starting to say, "I know that I can." potentially build a better business as well as do better for the land and, and and feel better about myself by being part of that. But back in the 30s and the 40s when Todd and the other boys were out in the fields kind of putting it together, none of this terminology and potentially not a lot of this knowledge kind of explicitly existed. Maybe implicitly there was people who worked the land. How, like, I'm curious to understand how it was for them and even for you now sort of being at the tip of the spear, if you like, with regards to this whole movement and the growth of this movement. Well, it was in the 60s that our first customer came. Up until the 60s, we just delivered our rice to the same Mm co-op here in town. It might have been grown differently, but it just went in with everybody else's. And the company called Chico San from Chico that made organic rice cakes is a macrobiotic company. Okay. Came and and, um, found my family. And they asked a lot of other farmers if they would grow organic rice. But my dad and uncle said, yeah that we would do that. Mm. And at that time, we didn't have a rice mill and we didn't have our own um, drying and storage facility. And so how many acres did they plant that first year, Brito? I think it was something like 76 acres. It wasn't a lot, right. but you know, it was <laughs> enough to convince them to make a go of it. And um, and soon they you know, bought an old bread truck and filled the back with bags of rice stenciled with the Lundberg name and hired a driver to stop at health food stores along the coast from California to Washington. And it was because they were growing their rice differently mm. and they believed that there was a consumer who wanted rice that was grown in a way that was consistent with their values, a consumer yeah. who cared about how their rice was grown. And so they decided to sell it 
you know, directly to sell it under their name instead of delivering it to the co-op. And of course, you know, by co-op, we're not talking about a, a natural food store, right? We're talking about a drying and storage facility that that accepted rice um, from all sorts of different farmers. Yep. That, that's drying and storage. Yeah. It's interesting that you talk about it because like when, if someone builds an infinitely better product and puts it back into the exactly same distribution model where there is no ability to differentiate that product in rice, like you could hold up a two and just by eyeballing them, it might be very hard to tell what, which one's from your farm, which one isn't. Like you're almost forced to then build your own distribution and mm-hmm. productize this stuff right down to the consumer. You had to challenge, do a whole bunch of things that most rice farmers don't have to do. Think about brand and marketing and price to consumer and what the relationship with the consumer was. Oh. Totally. And all the infrastructure too. Our drying and storage facilities had to had to build our own <laughs> rice dryer and our own rice mill and yeah, and really yep. figure it warehouse, out from the ground up. And figure out how to pack it and get it mm-hmm. to consumers. But and people really- responded, Vincent. I bet. <laughs> they did, right? We'd go to a, a food show and people were just saying, We want this organic rice and we mm-hmm. want brown rice. Yeah. And you could, you know, had to kind of teach people that that rice has a brain layer on it and and consuming brown rice is so healthy. Of course, our first mill only produced brown rice. <laughs> now now we've milled brown and white rice and provide consumers, I think, exactly what they want. But And I think we also had to do a lot of educational work on the like policy front too. Sure. My great uncle Homer uh, was among the, the farmers who banded together to form California Certified Organic Farmers, which was the first certifying body of its kind in the 70s, which was, you know, three decades before the National Organic Program was passed. Yep. And so um, it did uh, require a lot of, of additional work, and but it's so worth it, right? And it's, I think, offers the opportunity to be kind of self-determination, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and say, there, there is, this is what we want to do. And there's a consumer out there that's going to support this type yeah. of farming and wants yeah. this kind of food. And yeah. it's been one of the great joys of um, being able to, to to farm this way and be part of a, a family business is to see the response from consumers mm. who just say, "This is what I, this is what I want." Yeah, and just I'm trying to understand as well, like, and I think about kind of in Australia, one of the primary industries that we have is digging iron ore up out of the ground, and we're a long way from anywhere, but we then put this iron ore on boats and we send it predominantly to, to China, I think South Korea a bit as well. They then add a bunch of energy and turn it into steel and in a lot of cases just send the steel back to us because then we need to build roads and stuff. And the amount of value add that happens between putting literally rock on a boat and then getting back steel lumbers, you, you always ask the question, why are we making steel lumbers? You know, it's about a 100x markup between a bit of rock and a bit of steel lumber. I want, I'm curious is when you start to actually have your own mills and your own your productizing and packaging and distributing, you're moving up the value chain as well. How has it changed the economics of your business? Well, it's a good question. Vincent, organic rice is more expensive than sure. conventional rice. And so um, I guess that's just one point, right? We don't produce as much tonnage or weight per acre. And so we do have to uh, to charge more. We, um, I would say it, it, it helps us be more self have self determination. We do get to set the price, right? The classic uh, eco- economists will say um, the farmer is the ultimate price taker. You're going to take what what you get offered, and the market is going to make all maybe make all the money or or whatever. But we do think we have a very fair relationship with our customer as far as what it costs us to produce this and to pay our team here fairly. And then to uh, to move it into the market, although you know it is an unusual thing, and, and it's maybe not unusual, but but it leaves the cost that it leaves the farm at, and what it ends up on the retail shelf at, is you know about two x from what it leaves here until. Uh, and we don't just farm this rice ourselves. Farmers in our region have come to us and asked, "Hey, we'd like to farm organic rice too." It, mm-hmm. it, to be an organic rice farmer, you have to have a relationship with somebody that's going to dry and store and handle the rice and then mill it. Yeah. And sometimes growers will say, well, we see what you're paying us. And then we see what it's on the um, on the shelf for. And <laughs> hey, where, where's all where that coming all going? from? <laughs> yeah, exactly right. But, um, you know, the, the other thing I would just say is we're a good-sized farm, but we're still a, a small business. 
Right. And um, mm-hmm. our economies at scale compared to some of the huge rice companies, we're pretty small. And uh, all along the way, things do cost uh, a little more when you handle it in batches. We yeah. do have 17 varieties of rice. So every week we're probably milling five or six, seven different varieties of rice. And a big mill is going to have one variety. And they're going right. to mill the same variety every day right. and right. all day. And I just think, wow, what a luxury that is to uh, to be able to just have huge long runs. And, you know, between yeah. every milling, we have to do clean outs, uh, run downs and cleans outs and purges and, and then to start up again. And sure. and so it is more costly, but it I think our consumers like supporting, mm. you know, smaller and uh, smaller scale uh, family businesses. And, uh, yeah. and again, you know, rice that's that's grown in a way that's consistent with their values consistent with our values too yeah and i I know that we've taken 25 minutes to actually get onto the topic of actually how you do regenerative farming so i want to get into this help help me understand kind of that there's a terminology thing here for sure there's organic there's regenerative organic so help me understand some of the terminology but then specifically how this takes place on your farm what are the things that you're doing the big levers or the way this is done, um, and it's helped to understand all that. Well, I would just say organic has a definition in the United States. I think it has a definition in many, most parts of the world where it's defined. Regenerative is largely undefined. Mm. And that is, I think, an up and coming challenge is to define regenerative. Mm-hmm. And we believe that regenerative starts with organic and that organic is a continuum. In the United States, organic is defined by USDA in the National Organic Program, and that is the base. And then we believe that organic is a continuum that moves into regenerative and uh, into regenerative organic. Yeah, so so USDA National Organic Program sets a floor but not a ceiling. Hmm. Um, and so you have to meet you know the, the floor to, to claim organic, but you can do a lot more and still just be claiming organic, right? And so Mm -hmm. regenerative is not legally defined yet. It means different things to different people. So if you ask, you know, 10 people, what does regenerative mean? You'll probably get at least 10 different answers, if not more. (laughs) Um, Lots of people don't even believe regenerative has to be organic. But if you ask us, that's where it starts, right? Mm. It starts with organic because we don't really see anything regenerative about using toxic chemicals. I mean, even when you just think about the etymology, right? Like regenerative is associated with life, whereas, you know, herbicide and pesticide both contain the the suffix side, uh, meaning to kill. So for us, we, we think it starts with organic. We believe regenerative organic certified is the gold standard and the regenerative organic alliances, three pillars build on and further the legacy of the organic movement. They have pillars for soil health, animal welfare, and social fairness um, to make sure that regenerative organic certified is a holistic system that that delivers on on every level mm-hmm. in terms of soil health and social fairness. And, and, and so, Vincent, one of the things that the USDA has done in the National Organic Program is they have defined organic that it can even be organic hydroponic right. farming without soil right. and you know for us the nature of organic or the kind of organic farming we believe in has soil right it's got right. a soil it's plants growing in soil and caring for the soil and mm. and to farm without soil and that's why we've kind of said we're organic and we've been committed to organic but we believe the regenerative organic is going to def- to help bring definition that it's about the soil, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And more than that, though, it's about animal welfare mm-hmm. and about social fairness. Mm-hmm. And yeah. that the organic program at the USDA doesn't bring in so much animal welfare and a social fairness yeah. uh, approach. And so we yeah. believe that the regenerative, you know, really starts with organic, but it builds mm-hmm. and it builds along this continuum to a place we believe that consumers want to see their food. What does that you say, Brita? Be the change or, or eat the change you want <laughs> eat to see. Eat the change you want to see in the world. That's in right. The world. 
That's a great quote. I hope that one makes it into this. <laughs> I, um, I, think I, I wanted to understand some of the practical things that you're doing on the farm. Because yeah. when I went to the site and had a look at this, the idea that someone growing rice is trying to work out how to tie in with migratory birds. Yeah. I was like, <laughs> I, help me understand this. Tell me more. So just give me some of these three or four of these practical examples of exactly what you're doing in the regenerative approach of your overall farming practice, please. Totally. So we already talked about, you know, weed management with water, right? Which is just a really incredible uh, system. But kind of coming back to your question about water, when you think about Northern California, the landscape was originally wetlands and floodplains. A lot of Mm. people think about California and they think deserts, right? But but that's not Northern California. California. Northern California was was floodplains and wetlands. And so we try to replicate those those landscapes through our farming practices. And one of the ways that we do that is by flooding our fields um, after harvest. We flood our fields to provide habitat for thousands, if not millions, of migratory birds. Um, because the other thing about California is, you know, we're, we're part of the Pacific Flyway, a major migratory pathway for birds. Mm-hmm. But those wetlands and those floodplains that those birds depend on have been disappearing for decades due to development. Mm. In fact, 95% of them are gone. But rice fields replicate that landscape. And rice fields in the Central Valley provide more than 60% of nutrition and food resources for migratory birds as they travel the Pacific Flyway. Mm. Um, The other thing that they do is they reactivate the floodplain. A lot of the, the rivers and waterways in California have been dammed, which, you know, separates the the waterways from the landscape and you Mm -hmm. lose that interaction of land and water that creates a lot of food, um, including food for salmon. And and levied, right? Salmon levied. And essentially a levee is a dam Mm -hmm. uh, separating the river from the the floodplain. That's right. So as a result, the rivers have become sort of like food deserts for fish. They're too fast. They're too cold. Just channels, Mm -hmm. the blue channel that uh, that takes water from uh, the rim dam to the... um, to the the delta, but yeah. there's just walls on each side and a channel in between. Yep. And there's mm. no food there. There's no food. Mm. But when we have that water out on our fields providing the food and habitat for the birds, it also creates zooplankton, which is like fish food. Right. Um, and so because we have this super heavy adobe clay soil that holds water like a bathtub, like seriously, yeah. it has 0.00 inch per hour percolation. Like it's all sitting right on top there, right? Mm. But which makes it perfect for growing rice, but also allows us to return that water to rivers and streams when we're done with it. Mm -hmm. And so it takes with it that zooplankton and sort of like food delivery for salmon, right? It brings all these nutrients to the rivers where, where salmon can, can grow into, you know, we call them floodplain fatties. Um, They grow. (laughs) (laughs) I love love that you've got terms for all of these things. Scientific (laughs) terms, floodplain fatties. (laughs) When the salmon can get onto the floodplain or the floodplain, the Mm -hmm. food gets right into the river. Uh, yeah, where the salmon, the young salmon are, they'll grow as as fingerlings uh, or fry five to six times faster mm-hmm. than mm-hmm. when the floodplain is an inter- inter- interactive uh, with the river. And mm-hmm. there was a time when it was felt like the water coming off the rice fields was uh, kind of polluted, that was turbid and it had all this floating stuff in it. But that's the kitchen for the yeah. river. Right? Zoop soup. Yeah. Oh, zoop soup. That's good, Brie. <laughs> it's just like being out in the fields. And you're like, all right, I've got four hours to kill here. And I come up with some new terminology. <laughs> no, they're actually, you know, they're terms Times that have been developed by years. <laughs> that like California trout and like researchers at UC Davis. These are coming from PhDs. <laughs> okay. They're fun PhDs. Yeah, they're fun PhDs. Uh, you've done a good uh, analysis. Uh, mm-hmm. Brita is a word person. <laughs> yeah, she is a word person, and she picks up on on these sorts of terms. Uh, you got to have a shortcut for people. Keep going. <laughs> but it it gets back to your question about the water, right? Like the water in our fields, it looks like a ton of water. It's a lot of water, but it's multitasking water, right? right. It's doing so much more than growing rice. It's replicating California's natural landscape. It's providing food and habitat for millions of migratory birds. It's helping the salmon population rebound yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and so much more. You and, know, it's more than, food. and it's growing food. That's right. Yeah. And it's growing food. And so 
it's, you know, it's, it's part of our approach to regenerative. You know, we don't, we don't own animals. Uh, we don't, you know, raise sheep or, or cows or, or anything, but we have a relationship with the, the species who call our fields home. Mm. And we have an awareness that, that our fields are part of a broader landscape and a broader ecosystem. And, and we're in a relationship with that ecosystem. Yeah. And so some people would say that regenerative, you have, you can't till when you have to have herds of animals or own herds of animals. And we don't own herds of animals, but herds of animals come to our fields <laughs> and spend months there and, uh, and spend their winter here and yeah. then go back to. Uh, oh, and the other cool thing is it's, it's not like it's a, it's a win win. It's a win for the birds, right? But, yeah. but the other great thing is that they're out there eating weed seeds. Yeah. And, <laughs> you know, and aquatic, they're aquatic eating weed too, seeds, presumably. which is great for us. And then yeah. also, um, their feet put the, that nutrient rich rice straw into mm -hmm. contact with the soil, which helps create like mulch for the next year's crop. Yeah. yeah, and then they uh, they're good nutrient recyclers. That's right. And yeah. the, the nutrient they leave is a good you're nutrient for us. You're being diplomatic, diplomatic, <laughs> Bryce. I'm sure you've got a special word for for what they're actually doing. Uh, <laughs> fertilizer. Do okay. Fertilizer. Yeah, got it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, do you know what's interesting about this is like there's a there's a uh, founder who we interviewed on the show a while ago, and they have they basically their mission is to take plastic out of the oceans, mm. and they what they actually do is they sell a range of it's called Zero Co. They sell a range of kind of, you know, washing detergents and, you know, spray bottles for things that you need. And they're all made out of recycled plastic and you reuse them. But really mm -hmm. what they're doing is they're using all of that business to fund their version of regeneration, which is this mm -hmm. plastic's got to come out of the ocean. It's not enough to yeah. stop it. We actually also need to take it back out, the stuff that we put in. Yeah. And what's fascinating about it is, like, if you think about buying their product, you don't think, oh, I need some detergent or I need to go and restock my toilet paper, you think, well, this drives that outcome that I have. And so you talk about values alignment for sure, mm -hmm. but I also think there's outcome alignment, which is how do I preserve wetland? What role can I play right. in it? We'll buy rice. We'll buy a particular yeah. version of rice and you'll be playing right. a role in preserving the thing that you care about, whether you're in that part of the world or not. It just mm -hmm. it feels like a fascinating gear change and shift change for, from a business perspective to start, to start thinking about that as a business, but also mm -hmm. as a consumer, who do I have my relationships with? Well, the people who are doing stuff that I care about, obviously. Totally. And I think that's what's so important to, to help accelerate and continue this, this change on a broader scale, you know, cause we, we can't do it ourselves, right? Like the food system is so much bigger than us. And I think that we, need to help consumers understand that the true value of food and the, you know, the true cost as well is so much more than what's on the plate. It's how it impacts the planet. You know, and that is why I'm so thankful that Brita is here and her team <laughs> is to kind of tell the story, right? Yeah. And so that's what you're helping us do is tell yeah. the story because, mm -hmm. you know, we don't have multi-million dollar budgets to be able to blast the story uh, all, all over the um, the television or radio or or the news or, or print. We mm. we have to do it. For, you know, it's people to people. It's person yeah. to person. It's mm -hmm. uh, th this is that that is really the the best way for us. Certainly, we have learned to share our story on the internet mm -hmm. and have a direct to consumer relationship. But but really, it is telling the story to the people who have shops to the people who um, then are stocking the shelves so that they mm. can answer the questions. Yeah. There's and, just so many people. And also potentially people who are farming but maybe aren't thinking about their approach to farming this way or mm -hmm. looking for some form of inspiration. I always talk about a lot of storytelling is either part information and part inspiration, and I think mm -hmm. giving people a pathway for that is is critical for a system change, hence the name of the bloody podcast, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> the um, the know, thing I wanted to ask you. Could, oh, sorry, go could I just mention, sure. Brita talked about the, the water mm. and controlling weeds. You know, um, Vincent, here in, in Northern California, as you know, we have dry summers. Right. It doesn't rain in the summer. And I think maybe that's the same as, as in many parts of Australia. It doesn't rain in the summer. In many parts of the world where yeah. they grow rice, it rains all year long. Right. But we have these aquatic weeds, the bulrush, the small flower umbrella plant, 
the duck salad, uh, <laughs> and some of the lilies. They're aquatic. Right. And, and they're going to grow with the rice and just take over the rice. So mm. after we drown the grass, we let the fields dry up. And mm. for 30 days, the fields are dry. They get bone dry, so dry that you can just drive out there and the, the water weeds, they just kind of go to dust. And right. you could, you could, I mean, you got to be careful. You don't do it, but you could light the field on fire. It's that dry. And right. the rice comes really close to dying as well. Mm. But that's how we handle the aquatics, right? Mm. And so a conventional farmer will have herbicides for grass weeds and they'll have herbicides for broadleaf weeds. And then they have herbicides that kill both of them. And yeah, but we have to have a system yeah. that handles both of those. And we're just very fortunate that we do have that system and conditions. But during that dry up, the rice wants to stay with water. So mm. the roots get really big, right? Mm. You just think about it. You dry it up. What's going to cause the plants going to cause the roots to grow and, right. and, and really get stimulated to grow. And so when the water comes back on, that root structure is going to be feeding in a mm. much more developed part of the soil. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then it rehydrates really quickly. But um, yeah, it's going to it's gonna be tough on the plant while it's dry. But then also during that time when it's not, doesn't have water on it, you're not producing any methane, yeah. right? And, and, and so there's been studies to show that that system produces less greenhouse gas. 49%. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, and so we didn't start growing it that way because it produced less methane, but it's a good system for, yeah, uh, for climate, system. For climate uh, uh, systems as well. Yeah. And like just thinking um, like where to from here, 85 years in the making, but mm -hmm. you said before reg regenerative organic is a continuum. Like what's front of mind for you guys right now? And this is probably going to come out late March, you know, sometime mid to late March. So what's right on, right in front of you right now that, that we should know about and also like what's next? I know, I know that might be a, a large thing to answer. <laughs> yeah, so we set a goal in 2023 to transition all of the organic rice that we grow to regenerative organic certified by 2027. And we're making a lot of progress against that goal. But along with the acres, we have to communicate what regenerative organic means and why it matters, you know, to retailers and consumers, because we can't do this without them. We need people to not just be the change they want to see in the world, but, you know, like we said, to eat the change they want to see in the world by finding out where their food comes from, how it was grown and, and choosing food that not only tastes good, but is also, you know, in the case of regenerative organic certified, a force of land restoring, habitat preserving, community building wonder. Uh, we need people to eat like the world depends on it because it does. You know, we are using regenerative organic farming practices um, to produce the highest quality rice because we believe that the health of our bodies and our planet depend on it. Because um, it does. Because it, we believe it does. And so one of the ways that we do that is, is by launching new products made with regenerative organic certified rice. Another is, is by telling the story, right? So we just uh, last year in 2023, launched our Ducking Good Rice campaign <laughs> <laughs> as a way to start a conversation with consumers about what regenerative organic means to us. Um, yeah. Because as much as we love soil health and talking about the metrics that we track for soil health, they might not mean a whole lot to the average consumer. Mm. But you know, regenerative organic is so much more than soil health. It's also animal welfare. It's also sh social fairness. And, and so those cover crops that we grow during the winter to build soil health and provide fertility to our fields, they also provide habitat for ducks, <laughs> yep. um, nesting habitat for ducks. And so when we find duck nests in our fields, we strap on our hip waders and, and rescue the eggs by hand and transfer them to a local hatchery to be incubated, hatched, raised and released back into the wild. The fields uh, that are going to go into rice, Vincent, yeah. one of the first things we have to do as we prepare the fields, we're going to chop chop or mow the cover crop. Mm. And and so the, the ducks that have been nesting mm. in those cover crops, they're at, you know, they're at great risk. And those yeah. are the ones we're, um, we're rescuing. That we're, <laughs> That's right. Yep. 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 So, and so over the years, we've, we've rescued more than 30,000 of them. 
Wow. Um, yeah. And that's a conservative <laughs> estimate. That are going to be rested, that aren't going into rice, that we're going to harvest the cover crop for seed. Those ducks, they, they got to go through their whole cycle, right? They get a hatch and, and find their way out to the rice paddy. But the ones that we're going to plant. If they're in danger, we're, we're going to say we're rescuing them. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and you know, it's not just adorable, right? But it's also an expression of, of our founding philosophy to leave the land better than we found it and, mm. and representative of our commitment to um, regenerative organic farming practices that not only care for the land, but also the creatures who, who call it home. And so we're hoping that our Ducking Good Rice campaign helps us tell that story, helps cut through the noise, because there's a lot of noise out there and helps us continue that conversation with consumers about what regenerative organic means and why it matters. Yeah, wonderful. Vincent, you know, yep. when my grandparents came from Nebraska, they left their animals in Nebraska. And Grandpa Albert, he said, well, that's one of the best decisions we made is leaving the animals in Nebraska. But I do think as we continue to, to build on the regenerative, we do need to look at the role of the animals and the wild. Mm -hmm. And we, uh, we love the wild. And not that we ever want to get into, I think, the buying and selling of, of animals. But mm. an animal that is eating on a cover crop is stimulating the roots of that cover crop in a different way then if it's just growing on its own, it's mm. producing more enzymes, it's feeding the micro microorganisms, which then you know are stimulating more uh, healthy soil. And and so what's on my face is mm -hmm. we some of the growers that we are working with, they do bring herds of goats or sheep uh, onto their winter onto the winter land to help stimulate a, a new type of soil health. Mm. And I want to learn more about that. I want to understand more about that. And um, and then, you know, tillage. We have tried no-till rice. The first project I worked on with my family when I finished school was to 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 run the, the no-till rice farming project. And it was tough. And, um, and we tried it. We, we, we worked hard on uh, a, a 200 acres of, of sprinklers and of drill seeding and of not tillage, and not tillage over multiple years. And um, I would say that is a, um, a subject, a topic, a f farming uh, technique that, again, needs to be um, studied and considered. We believe a certain amount of tillage is, is needed and valuable. And um, maybe you remember a, um, a conservationist from Japan, uh, uh, Fukuoka, he wrote the book, um, One Straw Revolution. He visited our farm during that time and said, this is some of the ugliest rice or the worst rice I've ever seen in our no-till uh, farming approach. But, you know, I would say um, that's got my attention again, too. Um, <laughs> Wonderful. Hey, I, we'll probably have to leave it there for today. I'm, I'm mindful I've got to get, get through to something, but I, I, there's so much more we could have gone into. But um, it's clear that the, the road is, there's plenty in the road ahead. Uh, I want people to go and check it out, but I want people to understand and rethink their relationship with not just rice uh, or ducks, um, but the idea that of the role a farm plays in the things that we want to see in the world individually and collectively. So Breeder and Bryce, thank you so much for joining me for today. And I'm yeah, really look forward to seeing the stuff that's coming out just when this show is going to be released as well. So stay tuned for that too. Thank you so, Thank you so much, much, Vincent. Vincent. Love talking with you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Shape the System. As usual, if you'd like to suggest a guest, someone that you know who's helped change the system for the better, please go to www.shapethesystem.org, click on the top right-hand corner, then click Suggest Guest. Make sure that you click Subscribe so that you get the new episode. Shape the System is an independent podcast with support from KPMG High Growth Ventures. Connects founders to the services they need along their journey. Whether you are looking to refine your strategy, mature your finance function, prepare for a capital raise, expand abroad, or simply comply with regulatory requirements, they provide you with the support you need to drive your business forward.